Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Cornfield Customs channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the work I've knocked out last week and some of the work I've got started this week, show you guys around the shop a little bit more with some of the tools and equipment that I use almost every day. So stick around in this video as I show you around and we'll talk about some of the work that I knocked out. All right, so last week I was able to knock out a lot of the stuff that I had on my list. Uh, I bent some stainless handrails for a client, uh, finished up the woodwork on the Mack truck fender buck, which that'll be in a future episode going over how I made that. And I'll show it to you here in a second in the video when we get to that section of the shop. So we've got that going on. Uh, I welded up a Miller IndyCar axle for a local Indy restorer. Um, so I've got that that got finished up. A bunch of little things that just can pile up if you don't keep after them. I didn't get any massive work done on any of the major projects, but I made sure to get as much of the little projects knocked out on my list that I could. And then we took the, the ambulance conversion on its maiden voyage. We went up and saw some friends in New Jersey. So that was awesome. The trip went good, bus worked great. Everything was pretty much as expected. And I'm really glad that I got rid of our class C motorhome and did this ambulance conversion. Cause I mean, the diesel, the diesel ran awesome. It got decent gas mileage. It's just enough room for what we need and not have too much space. It was easy to maneuver everywhere we went. So I'm happy I did that. But let me show you around the shop kind of uh, where we left off before. I know in the last video, I talked about some of our metal shaping equipment over here and some of the machine tools in the back here. So I'm gonna pick up where we left off with that. Over here is where I kind of keep our mobile welders. So I have a Miller MIG welder that rarely ever gets used. Um, it probably takes me two, maybe three years to go through a bottle of welding gas. Um, I can't remember how old the spool is that's in that. You guys that have followed me for a long time know that I do not like using the MIG welder on anything in the shop. Everything gets TIG welded, sheet metal, chassis, tube work. I'm just a big proponent of TIG weld everything. So then we have, this is my Miller Synchrowave 250DX. Uh, that's my mobile machine, so I can wheel it around the shop to the project, work on it. So I just keep them stored up here, tucked out of the way. And then I have our Bailey NC press brake. This is a great versatile machine. Not everybody's gonna need a press brake. It's a little more than what I need, but man, it's super handy when you need it. It was one of those things, they were on sale. I bought one and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, I've had it, I think five or six years and it's just been it's been awesome to have around. It's allowed me to do things in the shop that I never even imagined I would need to do. So it's really handy to have around and I'm glad that I do have it in the shop. And then here is my uh, fixture table. It's also a Bailey. Um, it's a big cast iron unit. This thing is awesome when I'm fixturing up repeat parts and uh, locking everything down. I do a lot of my welding and clamping on this big table. Um, this is really handy. It's nice and heavy. So um, yeah, that gets used a ton. So I drilled and tapped the end of the fixture table and I bolted my tubing notcher to it. Um, that way I have a nice solid base to have the notcher to. And right here on the corner, I can swing the drill uh, all the way around as needed to get the proper notch. So this is also a Bailey unit. I've probably notched thousands and thousands of tube ends and stuff on this machine over the years. Um, I'm really big on not just having tools for tools sake. Everything needs to be used. And if I don't use it, I'll eventually just get rid of it. Um, that was one of the things with uh, the South Bend shaper I had. I had it for years. It never really got used. So it had to go because space is a premium. Um, this is one I think you guys will really like. It doesn't look like anything fancy. It's just a snap on tool cart, but to save my walking around, when I'm working on a project, I'll take my cart with me, um, just like most mechanics and fabricators do, but I have all of the tools that I use almost daily um, right on top, and I use these little grids with pins and stuff in it. That way I can easily see if something's missing, and like you can see right here, one of my Allens is missing, and this one had fallen off of uh, its pin. So it's nice that you can do it a quick glance, see what's missing, and you can just stay a lot more organized because being organized is key. If you're not organized, it's gonna take you a lot longer to find your tools and keep track of what you're doing. And 
I really like to stay as organized as possible, even though sometimes it's not really uh, all that easy to do. So continuing on in my tool cart, I keep all my air tools that I use pretty much on the daily. And then my standard hammers and dollies that I use a lot. I have a lot more over in my big box, but these are the ones that are my go-to that I use all the time. And then we have clamps, snips, pliers, and then Clecos and drills, and then some snips and our shrinking disc in the bottom. So this is my go-to cart for pretty much every day. It's all the stuff I use all the time and I recommend everybody getting a cart and putting your most used tools on it so it can just follow you around the shop and you're not constantly running back to your big box to chase tools. But then I have our Pexto power shear. This used to be a line shaft powered machine and someone converted it with a big industrial three phase motor. So I'll turn this on and kind of show you. I don't have three phase in the shop, so everything has to run off of phase converters. I've got a bunch of VFDs, static converters, and a handful of roto, uh, like rotary phase converters. I could switch the shop over to three phase, but it, I mean, it was like a $65,000 price tag to get the power here. So it's really not worth it for me when I can run everything on converters. So we've got our converter on and we fire up the motor which spins the big flywheel. And then for every press of the treadle, it'll uh, drop the shear. So it just works on a locking pin. So if you just stand on the pedal, the shear will just keep going. So on this machine, especially being as old as it is, it's uh, not necessarily the safest machine out there because it is probably a hundred years old. Um, you just gotta make sure to step on the treadle once for each shear that you want. I'll turn this back off and we can continue the walk around. This is probably one of the handiest tools in the shop and it is a Rotex turret punch. So I do a lot of holes in sheet metal and like punching holes in paper patterns and cardboard patterns. So for those of you that don't know what a Rotex is, it is a series of different diameter punches and the heads rotate. Um, so I'll have to see if I can um, clamp this camera on so I can kind of show you how it works. But it's really nice because you have a series of, I don't know if you'll be able to pick that out. So it goes from an eighth inch all the way around up to a two inch, and then you have the corresponding bottom. So let me show you how it works and I'll clamp this up. So you'll pick out the diameter you want and we'll just go with a 5 16 So it says 5 16 there and then that is in the F slot. So then we push down this lever and to turn that top, there's a lever here, I push that and that allows me to spin that. So we'll go back to our 5 16 F, push this handle down and we can spin that around to an F, make sure it's locked in and I like to just dry run it to make sure that everything is lined up. So then we can just punch our hole and we have a 5 16 hole. We'll say now we need to do We'll just say an inch and an eighth hole. So inch and an eighth in, we'll rotate this around to in, make sure everything's lined up. And then we have an inch and an eighth hole. So I like this a lot just so I don't have to constantly be changing tooling out. I've had a couple different punches in the past to where that's what you had to do. Every time you wanted to change the diameter, you had to change out the tooling, which for me is very inefficient, especially if you have to go back and forth. Then the stainless tube is just something I whipped up out of old leftover exhaust tubing, and it just pipes down to this catch can, and it, it catches all of the waste off of the Rotex. So this thing is super cool. I felt super fortunate when I got one, and if anybody stumbles across one, I highly recommend a Rotex or a turret punch of some sort in your shop. It'll make you way more efficient and it's just a super handy tool to have around. So then I have just a flammable cabinet and I keep a lot, just mainly spray paint in there. Um, and then I have this one, which I did the video on, which is just my charger bank for all of my batteries. So if you haven't seen that video, head on over and check that out. Fire is a big concern. So I like to keep all my batteries contained in a cabinet 
um, just in case something happens and I'm not here. I keep a lot of my tools and stuff that I sell. They're here ready to get final prepped and shipped out. And um, sandpaper, Scotch-Brite, cutoff wheels, grinding discs, all of that stuff is here. Tubing dies, tubing roller dies, dimple dies, all of that stuff. I just keep on these shelves so it's nice and tucked out of the way. And then I have a Bailey 50 ton press. Right now I've just got in our uh, stamping fixture for stamping logos into the tools. Um, I mean, most guys know what a hydraulic H-frame press is, so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about it. Figured I'd show you since I'm walking around. And then this one is really cool. This is my, uh, my Grobe bandsaw. So it's a vertical bandsaw made by Grobe in Chicago, Illinois. Um, when I got this one, I needed to buy some parts for it, and Grobe is still in business, so I reached out to them, and I had to give them the serial number, which is down here, and they ran the serial number, and they were like, wow, we haven't had one this old uh, be called about in a long time, and they told me this one was manufactured uh, pre-World War II, so this thing is old, and it's still kicking ass, and I mean, it works great with minimal upgraded parts. I think I upgraded the blade guides and I put new tires on the main rollers. Other than that, this thing is all original. So this one is a super cool machine. So I'll walk back up a little bit. Main toolbox with all the other tools that I don't use on the daily, but all my tool storage is there. And then I have my big welding and frame table here. I've had this thing my entire career. I got it when I was about 18 years old. I pulled it out of a scrap bin um, for a place that made tractor trailers. This was the end of one of their tables for making tractor trailers. It was actually this way, about 60 feet long, and they would build the tractor trailers on there. And I guess they had changed the length of the trailers they were building and they clipped them all off. So I pulled it out and I use it mainly this way. Um, so it's made of big heavy I-beams. You can see here, big heavy I-beam, and then I put this five by 10 half inch thick plate on the top. So this is my other big layout, fixture, and welding table. And I have a stationary Miller 200 synchro wave that just stays here and it is just for welding on this table. So I do a lot of welding here as well as at the other fixture table. And I've got just a bunch of, you know, the water cooler for the TIG machine, uh, weld positioner, little odds and ends for welding. And even though I've got the, C, the NC press brake, um, I have this little box pan brake just for doing little, little things. Um, that way, if it's something quick and easy, I don't have to go set up the press brake. Um, that way I don't have to program anything. I can just come over, do a little bend, much easier than setting everything up. So nothing wrong with having Manual machines, smaller machines, they all have their purpose. You don't have to have all the big fancy stuff. Nothing wrong with older hand tools. Then I just store our rotary draw tubing bender here. Um, we saw the dies over there on the shelf. So this is on wheels. I just park it over here to keep it tucked out of the way. And here is our Burr King belt grinder. This is another machine that is invaluable. Um, there is a difference between some of the other manufacturers and a Burr King, and I think Burr King is awesome. When I got this, uh, this model four or five years ago, I mean, it, it just, it's awesome. You know, you can't bog it down. It's so easy to change the belts and stuff out on. Like this little door flops open, and that takes the, that slackens it so you can change the belt out. And then once you put the new belt on, it ratchets back up in place, and you can close the door for quick and easy belt changes. And I also have a fixture that goes on here. So you can replace the bottom wheel with this, and it makes it an ID grinder as well. It just takes, it, takes a little bit bigger of a belt. Um, but having that ID grinder attachment, it took me years to decide to buy it, but I'm glad I did. It's, it's super handy when you need it. And I try to keep a lot of the dirty stuff back in this area of the shop. So we've got the grinder here, pedestal buffer here for buffing tools. A lot of tool, uh, pull max tooling gets buffed here. Electric buffer with cotton wheels on both sides. And then here 
just all the belt storage for the belt grinder and pedestal grinder with a wire wheel and I've got two industrial grinders that uh, I'm finally getting wired up so I'm going to put them to use they've just been tucked in the corner for a while and this is my power hacksaw it's kind of tucked away I can't remember if I've talked about it or not in the past but I lost a bearing a couple years ago on it and the bearing costs more than the machine does so I haven't pulled the trigger on buying that replacement bearing yet but man that is a cool machine just to see how it works and that it was designed with no computers it was all paper pencil protractor ruler just the engineering that goes into some of this older equipment is amazing so hopefully I'll get that one back up and running eventually because it's it's a really cool machine um, sandblast cabinet so scat blast sandblaster and here's just random sheet metal storage up top small drops of tubing even smaller drops in that little shelf and we have the, N the CNC plasma table back here which I don't use a lot much anymore but um, I still do that and then we have all of our tube storage and some extra sheet metal storage here so we have the 2x3 there then some 2x4 188 wall and then full sticks of 2x4 120 wall and just some random other long sticks of tube and material that I use a lot so these will all be frame rails and bent components on the mandrel bender and I put all this stuff right here by the saw so just an old Kalamazoo horizontal bandsaw just for cutting everything down getting it ready to go in the bender and then this is the mandrel bender that you guys have seen in a bunch of the other videos if you haven't seen those videos make sure to check those out I have a lot of great content on mandrel bending frame rails and tube sections so that's where all that's done if you guys haven't seen that before and then we are back to the bandsaw. So I just walked around this little area here. Showing some more of the tools and equipment. And in the next video, I'll do a deeper dive in the back room, which is where I keep a lot of personal projects uh, and parts and material overflow. So that's a little bit more of the shop layout deep dive into some more of the tools and equipment that I use. I'm sure you can see that I have lots of stuff all over the walls, up in the rafters. I just like to collect a lot of different stuff. So I have all of, all of the tools, all the equipment, some wall art and that stuff. And that brings me back to a full circle. And here is the majority of the finished Mack truck buck or the Mack truck fender buck. Um, there's still a few little things to do to it, but I'm at the point where I can start shaping metal. So I am gonna do a deeper dive video on how I made this buck based on the original fender that I had, how I made all the, uh, how I made all the stations, trimmed everything, what the holes are for, all of that stuff to kinda help you guys understand what goes into building a buck like this and that way you can build bucks on your own and have a better understanding of how they are used to accomplish your goals. And you can see that, uh, hopefully you can see in this, this buck is massive because the fender is massive. So I'll walk up here and you can see just how big this fender is um, with me next to it. It's almost six feet tall. Um, it's about almost two feet wide. So I mean, it's an old Mack truck semi fender so it's going to be big and that means the buck is going to be big and on that note of other videos i'm working on just to help keep this part of the channel streamlined and focused on the metal shaping and fabrication side i'm going to be opening up another youtube channel and putting more of the adventure type stuff like traveling to race events racing going to other people's shops hunting down vintage race cars going and getting them just for the guys that want to see that stuff that way it doesn't clutter up the main cornfield customs channel so i will drop a link to that new channel in the description below or you can search it out and it is cornfield customs off the clock so if you're interested in seeing more of the behind the scenes after hours not necessarily working on just metal shaping and fabrication in the shop make sure to check that channel out because that's where we're gonna be funneling all of that other stuff in the future. I'm gonna wrap this video up, 
just so it doesn't draw out too far. If you've made it this far, I greatly appreciate it. And hopefully you guys enjoyed seeing some of the other equipment in the shop, kind of the layout, how things are set up for me to be as efficient as I can. And thank you guys so much for checking out this video. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel out and drop a comment. Let me know what you think. Our videos are gonna be changing a little bit. Um, hopefully for the better. I've got a, a guy coming in to help do some of the filming and editing. So hopefully that takes our videos and the content to the next level. So make sure, again, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, be a subscriber, drop a comment, like the videos, let us know how we're doing and how we can do better to get you the videos and content that you wanna see. So again, thank you guys so much for checking out this video as well as the others, and we will catch you on the next one.